Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Upside of 40. Thanks for joining us once again. Uh, many a man has fantasized the life of the open road, being an outlaw on the back of a Harley Davidson motorcycle, living life as a made member of an OMC, or rather an outlaw motorcycle club. Well, my guest today was all that and more as a prominent member of the Outsiders Motorcycle Club. He was also closely associated with the Hells Angels for many years. And he happens to be a counterterrorism and threat protective services expert, which I'm certain helped him to survive in a very dangerous world for a very long time. And folks, he has just written a book titled Patriot Gangster that chronicles his life as a one percenter. Welcome, Jeff Burns, to Upside of 40. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Hey, Jeff, uh, starting out, and I mentioned one percenter. I'm, I'm sure a lot of people don't know what that means. Uh, please uh, tell us. Uh, the definition of a one percenter so i think a lot of one percenters in this day and age don't even know what it means anymore hmm. um but the generally accepted definition um by outlaw motorcycle clubs the one since we were the ones that put the patch on we defined it and it simply identifies the most elite of the elite of outlaw motorcycle clubs because you have different types of outlaw motorcycle clubs and and the top of the food chain is are the one percent clubs and they self-identify as outlaw motorcycle clubs, but that doesn't mean that there's any criminality about it. It just means that those clubs formed outside the authority of the AMA, the American Motorcycles Association. And so um, there's different stories, and it's actually an issue that I've done a lot of research on, and it appears the the one percenter moniker was adopted um, in the 1950s in San Francisco, or in the Bay Area, I should say, uh, amongst a lot of the Bay Area and Southern California clubs that included the Hells Angels, the Gypsy Jokers, and, and some other other clubs. Um, and, uh, you know, they adopted it to kind of thumb their nose at the American Motorcycle Association, who had said that, you know, the majority of American motorcyclists are law-abiding citizens, and 1% are the hell raisers and the outlaws. Mm. And so back in the the 50s, you know, when the clubs were being really formed by guys in, in their 20s that were just back from war, their rebellious attitude caused them to embrace that. And we said, yes, you know, um, yeah. this is who we are. The patch went on. And, and that's the true definition of a one percenter. We were just motor, we're the top of the top, and we formed outside the AMA's, you know, authority and sanctioning. Now, law enforcement has a totally different uh, definition. And they say that the 1% patch means that we are the 1% of motorcycle clubs that exist for the purpose of criminal activity and we're organized criminal enterprises. And that's absolute bullshit. Mm -hmm. Well, um, you know, uh, and folks, I, I mentioned Patriot Gangster, which is just out. So we're going to tell you how to get a hold of a copy uh, probably several times as we talk. But uh, there's going through the book, uh, Jeff, there's a, a quote in there that just grabbed me right away. And uh, you say, being an outlaw doesn't mean being a criminal. Good men are outlaws, and the world needs outlaws. Uh, please explain that statement to me, what you meant by it. Sorry, I, it, this, it's emotional for me. Hmm? You, you look, you're talk, we're talking about something that um, has ruined my life for, for standing up for what I believe. And so when you ask me to define what an outlaw is, <clears throat> excuse me, mm. what I mean by that quote, the world needs outlaws, is the world needs men like me. And I'm not the only one. There mm. are a ton of great men um, in the outlaw motorcycle club community who believe the same way I do. There are men in the military who, who believe the same way I do because outlaw motorcycle clubs and the military are really so similar because outlaw motorcycle clubs were founded by military members returning from com combat. And, and so there's a lot of active duty military men and, and you know, uh, former military members who are in the club world. But what I mean by the world needs outlaws is we need individuals who are willing to buck society's norm and not say what America wants to hear, but what America needs to hear. And just because someone says you can't do this, if you know it's the best thing for America, if you know it's the best thing for you and you're not gonna trample on anybody's rights, then go ahead and do that. And really where I learned that philosophy from is, it kind of goes along with the title of your podcast. It was after I turned 40 and I looked back at what my grandpa taught me 
as a young man because even though he was a lawman, he was a sheriff, he was a former firefighter, he ran the general store, he was a rancher, he was an outlaw because if you'll read about an incident in the book, um, you know, there were a couple of dogs harassing his prized horses. And at eight years old, he told me to take out the ho- or the dogs before they injured his horses and cost him thousands of dollars. Now, I did what he told me, and I didn't realize that was illegal. Um, per rancher law, it was okay. Mm. Um, and it wouldn't be until later in my life when I had the same incident with my prized military dogs that I train and, and personal protection dogs, and it, this time it was horses, and I turned the tables and realized, wait, 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 I can't do that because it's a crime now, you know, and it was a crime back then, but that was the law of the West. And that was my grandpa being an outlaw and doing what needed to be done in the moment, because had he waited for law enforcement, it wouldn't have solved the problem, you know? And, and uh, so that's what I mean is, is just because, you know, you might do something gray it doesn't make you a criminal you know i didn't exist i didn't live my life as an adult committing crimes but were there times that i gave people a black eye or did something that maybe was illegal absolutely yeah um you know and the only reason i don't do some of those things today is because i've been labeled an organized crime member and a gangster which is not an outlaw that's a criminal that implies criminality and if i was to do something like that I get extra enhancements to put me in prison, you know, for, it depends on what they, they use in an, an enhancement. If it's just a gang enhancement or it's a gang enhancement with a firearm enhancement, I'm looking at 25 years for a simple bar fight, whereas the other guy goes home, you know? And, and uh, so I have to be really careful with how I interact with people these days and, and, you know, remind myself that outlaws, while I think they should exist and I believe the world needs outlaws, unfortunately they can't exist anymore. Um, you know, it's it's just the way we've gone as a society. Yeah, and it, it is, uh, you know, very clear. I, I know even when I grew up, it, you kind of, uh, there was a man's code. I mean, that honor and a handshake meant a lot. That has certainly changed dramatically. You mentioned, you know, gray things that you do or whatever. But it sounds to me that life for you was pretty black and white between right and wrong or what was honorable and what wasn't honorable. It had to be. Uh, it had to be for me, especially once I picked up that badge, because by carrying that badge, if I did anything wrong, I would have been made such an example of by law enforcement um, that you would know me and my book would be a bestseller now, yeah. you know, even though it hasn't been released until tomorrow. But, uh, you know, but I was that that white whale that they always talked about, the outlaw biker that made it into law enforcement as a plant to gather intelligence. But that wasn't why I did it. That wasn't my role. I never, ever did anything like that while I was, you know, in that profession. I did it to survive because I've got a skill set that doesn't fit with society. And that rolls back to I'm an outlaw. My my professional skill set can only be applied to really two things. And in this day and age, you know, one of those is not an option for me. It's not an attractive option, you know, and now I'm 45, almost 46. So it's time for me to retire. I can't do those two options anymore. Yeah. You know, those, that being, you know, law enforcement and active counterterrorism work. Well, and, you know, also, and uh, you, you talk about this background that you have, I mean, the counterterrorism and I mean, law enforcement, a lot of it uh, was involved in law enforcement. And yet you were able to enter this world. And I know that they knew all about your life. No, How they in the world. Uh, but but the, when you no, say they, I mean, who are you talking about? Well, the 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 club members, there were the guys clubs, that knew what you did didn't. for a yeah, right. Yeah. But um, I would think you would have. Well, I guess that's not true. You probably would have problems on the other side as well. But get but being trusted in that world, how did you ever balance it? How did you enter it, and and became uh, you know one of the most influential uh, people involved in the the OMC world? I think that that um, that is is probably the best place to start with my story is how did I enter the world? Because most people won't understand how you can have, have carried a badge and worked in law enforcement and been a one percenter at the same time. Mm-hmm. And for me, since I'm the only one that's ever done it um, and been active in law enforcement, there have been other guys that were cops and made it into one percent clubs. But I'm the first one that was actively working and everyone knew it. And um, the way it happened was I decided I wanted to be an outlaw biker when I was very young. I was a child. Um, I grew up 
you know, having seen Hell's Angels and packs in California and thinking that's the coolest thing. And someday I want to do that. And so I started chasing that opportunity and that dream, um, you know, as soon as I was old enough to at 21 years old, I'd been doing all the research on the clubs I could do. And back then, you know, we didn't have the internet like we do now. So I couldn't have been an internet trained biker like we get in this day and age um, or a TV trained biker like we get in this day and age. Um, you know, I had to do it the old way. And, and back then, and it still is true to some extent to this day, but if you want to be in an outlaw motorcycle club, um, for me back then, I wanted to be a Hells Angel. So you had to go find a Hells Angel. And there were no Hells Angels in Washington State really at the time. They were just getting started. And the the chapter, or the, excuse me, the charter, because they use the word charter for each one of their individual um, state franchises or, or city franchises. Um, but the closest one to me that I was attracted to because I wanted, it was important to me, I got trained by the old school guys, uh, was Oakland. And so I hopped on my bike and rode down to Oakland. And, uh, you know, before I told them I wanted to go prospect, I did some undercover work. And so, you know, I started going to their parties in Oakland and Daly City and, um, you know, a couple of other areas in California where I knew the charters um, had a lot of respect. And that allowed me to learn their traditions and their protocols and, and how they dressed and their mannerisms. And, and I took that home with me. Um, and for a long time, I thought I was going to move to California and become a Hells Angel in California. But in the meantime, that Washington charter turned around and one of the members in California that had been mentoring me, you know, suggested I get close with them. And then something else happened with another club. And, and, uh, next thing you know, um, I ended up uh, uh, telling the Hells Angels I wanted to go prospect for them uh, with the Nomads Washington Charter here in, in Spokane at the time. And, and uh, um, I became very, very close with um, Josh Binder, who was their sergeant at arms at the time and um, one of their most respected uh, enforcers in the club. And Josh began to mentor me on how to be a Hells Angel and a one percenter and an enforcer and a sergeant at arms. and. Um, taught me a whole lot that had I not learned that from him um, and from, you know, guys like Moldy Marvin in Oakland, um, I wouldn't have survived in the club world, I don't think. And I certainly wouldn't have, have risen to the level that I did. And so I had almost 10 years um, because, you know, let me back up a little bit. Josh ended up uh, getting into trouble uh, for some stuff that he did while he was in the club. Um, the several of the club members caught racketeering indictments and he ended up getting sent to prison for 14 years. Mm -hmm. um, so while he was in prison uh, or prior to him going to prison, he had come to me and said, hey, you know, I'll take you to the table. You can be a hell's angel if you want. But there's some stuff going on now and because you're not a member. I can't talk to you, but I just want you to sit back and watch what happens over the next month. And if you like what you see and you're OK with it, you can move forward and I'll make sure you become the best hell's angel ever. And if you don't it's not too late for you to go the other direction. So, mm -hmm. you know, he was supposed to be my sponsor in, in the club. And he said, you know, I just want you to sit back and see what's going to happen. And I said, okay. And there was some stuff that happened in the club and I realized it was not what I was looking for. Um, there was not the brotherhood that I thought was there. And uh, so I went the other way. I stayed close with the Hells Angels, did criminal defense investigations for several of their members over the years, helped out with the RICO case that Josh was involved in. Um, and I had done so much criminal defense investigative work for the various clubs and been around the community enough and, you know, established my own reputation for handling myself that in 2007, when I got the opportunity, I was at a crossroads in, in my career and, and um, there was some stuff going on overseas that was not good and showing up on YouTube. And um, I had the opportunity to go to work for the state undercover. I wouldn't be investigating outlaw motorcycle clubs. Um, in fact, in, in the 10 years that I had the position, I never once investigated an outlaw motorcycle club member, lots of other types of gang members and organized crime members, but not an outlaw motorcycle club mm -hmm. member. And uh, so when it was time for me you know, to make a decision, I, I, I had to, to make a decision. Do I want to have a career that's lucrative and, and or not lucrative, but it, it's going to pay the bills and take care of my family? Um, and there's job security there because it's a state job. There's good benefits. Uh, or do I want to pursue my dream of being an outlaw motorcycle club? Because you can't do both, right? or, or that's the way I thought it was at the time. That's everything I had been taught was you can't do both. 
And so I went to the Hells Angels, who I was closest with of, of the four major outlaw motorcycle clubs in Washington. I was closest with them. And I said, hey, guys, you know, here's what I'm going to do. So I'm not going to be able to talk to you anymore. And we can't be friends. And, you know, I won't be able to hang around the clubs anymore. And they were OK with me taking my job and continuing it. They were in the middle of the RICO trial, too. And, and <laughs> I'd explained that this would help build credibility if I got called to testify. You know, being able to list that in my curriculum vitae would would. Uh, help out on the stand with a jury for sure. Um, Cause I wouldn't just be another outlaw biker that knew a lot and had some investigative experience. Mm. And uh, um, they were okay with it. So I followed the same thing with the banditos and then the gypsy joker and you know, the outsiders and everybody was okay with it. And, and uh, for, I don't know, I think two years, almost two years, um, I did my own thing in the club world and maintained that job. And then I went prospect for the outsiders and um, once I was a member of the Outsiders, uh, the Outsiders are so heavily involved in the motorcycle rights movement or had been so heavily involved in the motorcycle rights movement. Part of that and one of the primary issues was motorcycle profiling, which is cops harassing bikers for dressing and looking like bikers. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so since they were involved in the cause, I applied some of my investigative knowledge to help the cause. and taught them how to use public records requests to get dash cam video and evidence of profiling. And at the time, uh, the president of the Outsiders, uh, Double D, he was a former national debate champion and, and debate coach, coach. and uh, he was heavily involved in the rights movement as well. And, and when we got together in the same club and I had the ability to speak my mind as a member, um, we just clicked. And there were a couple of things that went down in the motorcycle club community. Um, the most significant of which was uh, an individual was on his way home from our clubhouse and he belonged to a, a family motorcycle club. He, he's a Boeing engineer and a state trooper pulled him over and we caught the state trooper on, on his own dash cam video telling this biker, this, this Boeing engineer that he'd arrest him for, or he, he better take off his helmet or he'd arrest him for, uh, uh, I'll think of something. And that's what we needed to prove profiling because that kind of stuff had been going on all the time in Washington state and not just Washington state, but all over the country, every state where there's motorcycle clubs that happens. And, uh, it, the profiling gets worse. You know, mm -hmm. I've had horrible things happen to me because of it, both while I was in the club world and since I've left, um, you know, and it, you just can't escape it once you're on their list and it's arbitrary who goes on the list. It's up to them. There's no qualifiers. Yeah. There's just a, here you go. Um, so it's a very tough situation to be in. Um, what were you able to accomplish uh, in that? Once we realm? unified the clubs, after, that stop allowed us to unify the clubs in Washington State. The outlaw clubs came together and we told all the rest of the motorcycle clubs that if you're going to be a motorcycle club in Washington State, you need to get on board and stand up for your rights and fight alongside us. And we pushed for motorcycle profiling legislation in Washington. We've been pushing for it for five years, but we hadn't been able to get a sponsor. Finally, once we got all the clubs together, we pulled it. We did a couple of protest runs on bars that were not allowing motorcycle club members to wear their patches in what's called a no colors policy. And those were so hugely successful. And we unified all the clubs and got over 350 of us to show up to these bars along with our attorney. And, you know, let them know that, hey, we want to come into your bar, but you won't let us. And you're running off of a, a false stereotype that we don't get along <laughs> um, and that we war wherever we go. So we'd like you to change our poli your policy because it violates our first and our 14th Amendment rights. All the bars we visited changed their policy that fired up the community and also got a little press attention. And um, from that, we were able to get some sponsors for our le legislation. It took us two years, but we eventually passed that legislation here in Washington unanimously in both the House and the Senate. And at that point, Double D and I um, got recognition nationally from the club community because everyone wanted to know, one, how we were unifying the, the outlaw clubs and getting us to get along, and two, how we were passing laws that protected bikers from being harassed by cops. Nobody had ever done that. And it's modeled, our, our motorcycle profiling law here in Washington is modeled identical to our racial profiling law. So it was an easy sell. There was no physical impact. There was no cost to it. Um, it simply it required them to add a training policy into their manual and, and mandatory training for the cops, which was oh. an hour. Um, and so uh, it passed unanimously here. There was 
the way it passed allowed us a lot of momentum um, to then start traveling the country. And Double D and I started traveling the country, and we spoke to tens of thousands of bikers. I couldn't even guess how many, because you know, at some of the events, there would literally be 10,000 bikers standing out there in a big sea in front of us. Um, it was really probably the most beautiful and amazing thing I've ever been involved in. Mm -hmm. Seeing a community that's been so marginalized and has this reputation for being criminals and, and violent thugs come together and start what ended up becoming a successful national grassroots rights movement. Um, I ended up testifying in front of both the House and the Senate in Maryland, and we passed Maryland's motorcycle profiling law. Um, and now it's been passed in Louisiana and Idaho as well, and there's several other states working on it. Um, unfortunately, the momentum that we had and the movement was totally disrupted in 2015 uh, by the Twin Peaks incident in Waco, Texas. But um, it's still moving forward. It's just uh, not what it once was. Yeah. Well, and, and there is a, a, a side to um, OMCs that, that uh, you know, does involve uh, some criminal activity. There's there's violence involved in many of these clubs. And uh, you talk about, you know, you, you were drawn to it at a young age. Um, but I, I think a lot of people wondered, like, what was it about that life that you wanted to be a part of? Because, um, you know, in many situations, it's, you know, as I mentioned at the top, you know, got me think, oh, I could see myself riding that Harley down the road. Well, there's, there's, <laughs> that's just the fantasy part of it, really, uh, mm -hmm. that's involved, because it really does become your life. And there are, uh, you know, there's a lot of confrontations that happen. You describe in the book, also physical physical violence that uh, is involved in as well. What was it about it that that you, you know, were willing to be a part of that and, and were drawn to it? Um, my primary motivator for getting involved was I wanted to be part of a culture that lives and revolves around a code of loyalty honor, brotherhood, and respect. And to me, as a young man in my early 20s, um, you know, it, it made sense to me that if you violate that code, you suffer the repercussions. And um, so if I voluntarily chose to get involved in the Outlaw Motorcycle Club world, and then I did something that got me beat up or got me killed, um, I, I, I need to hold myself accountable for my misdeeds and suffer the consequences rather than run to the cops and say, let me tell you what happened and let me tell you about these guys and get myself out of trouble and into the witness protection program. You know, it, you just can't call foul if you knowingly involve yourself in something like that. And I really, even though UFC wasn't around at the time, nowadays I look at it like UFC, I, I, you know, or a fight club. If I choose to get involved in UFC, you know, and become part of a gym, I know there's going to be violence. I know I'm going to get socked in the face, you know, and uh, that's part of what you sign up for. So you can't call foul on it when it happens. Mm -hmm. And that was the primary motivator. But very quickly after I started hanging out with the Hells Angels in the very beginning in California, what I saw happen happening was law enforcement was harassing them to a degree I'd never seen before. And a lot of the things that I learned from my research about the Hells Angels or about outlaw motorcycle clubs was outright lies that law enforcement had told that had set that narrative. Or they were, they were partial truths, or they were facts that were taken from incidents in the 1960s and being portrayed as they were happening today. And so that drew me into wanting to be an outlaw biker even more because now I want to know the truth. And so that kind of goes back to that question you asked me before about the world needing outlaws. I was such, I, I was so willing to, to just put myself at risk, suffer violence, suffer being labeled a gangster and being, you know, an organized crime member just so I could learn the truth about the Hells Angels and the Outlaw Motorcycle Club world. And so that's kind of where I go back to my definition of an outlaw. An outlaw is not a criminal. He's just some someone or she's someone who's willing to go above and beyond the average person to satisfy their own curiosity or their own drives. And that's what I did there. And then once I got involved and I experienced the brotherhood and I experienced some of the danger, and, and, and you know, cause I got involved in the tail end of the war years, um, you know, that drew me in even further because yeah. 
there's no difference in fighting alongside your brother. Uh, you know, whether you're doing it in a sanctioned environment or, or an unsanctioned environment, the love, the camaraderie, the adrenaline, the brotherhood, it's all there. Mm. The, the difference is, is when it, the violence happens in the outlaw motorcycle club world, especially shortly after I got involved, the majority of the violence was being instigated by law enforcement intelligence and, and their undercover operatives and not by club on club violence because that's what we're about. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I want to be very clear. There was that period in Outlaw Motorcycle Club culture where the clubs were at war. Um, and very quickly, we realized that had to stop because the feds were starting to use RICO effectively and guys were going to prison for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. And so I was in that generation and I was one of those leaders that helped us. I was really vocal about how we needed to move away from the patch pulling and, and the bullshit, excuse me, my language, the nonsense violence, because it, it was opening it up the clubs and everyone involved for a RICO. And even if you didn't get a RICO over it, your clubhouse and all the officers' houses were going to get raided, and that pissed everybody off and caused a bunch of damage, and somebody's dog was going to get shot in the process, inevitably. And, you know, that's just the way it went. Mm. Um, you know, and once I started seeing that transition and being part of it, then it was my personal mission to see it through to the end. And, and we had unified the clubs, and I wanted to see if we could save the culture. You know, and right when we were on track to do that, uh, law enforcement created the Waco incident and, and that destroyed everything for us. Or you really sent us the, back. Uh, but you mentioned the one percenters and the way law enforcement looks at it. They say that those are the criminals. Those are the, the ones who ride motorcycles and commit crimes. How much is criminal activity? How much criminal activity is involved in these clubs or at least during that period of time that you, you're, you, know, you were there and are, are aware of? How much so, was there in it, in these clubs? There's no organized criminal activity. In fact, motorcycle clubs are the most disorganized. Well, no, I've seen some volunteer fire departments. <laughs> They're more disorganized and dysfunctional than outlaw motorcycle clubs. But outlaw motorcycle clubs are one of the most dysfunctional organizations you can think of. And to think that they're involved in, in criminal activity as an organization is nonsense because most of most of the members of an individual charter or chapter of a club won't get along with each other. Ego is so infested in the outlaw motorcycle club culture because everybody everybody wants to be the guy. Everybody wants to be known and famous and respected. But really, in order to do that, you have to bust your ass. You have to take a lot of risk and you have to be in in the right club to be able to do that because politically some clubs just it's not going to happen for you if you're yeah. in one of those clubs um, so it's not like a mafia that, it, absolutely that, not. not that organized and, they... and so the crime that exists is either the methamphetamine addicts who are in the club because the outlaw motorcycle club culture has been plagued by methamphetamine since the hell's angels made it cool back in the 60s yeah. and it's starting to die out with my generation we we had enough second generation guys that their dads had been in clubs and so they had seen it and lived with it their entire life and then we had guys like me that came in and understood it and what it does to the environment and you know the club environment and, and uh so we we were adamantly against it and it's slowly working its way out of the culture but because we have that outlaw moniker that we like to adhere to within the clubs even though it, you'll get entire chapters like my old tacoma chapter i belong to we all hated it but because there was that one 40 year member who had been an addict his entire life and we all loved him, nobody was willing to pass, you know, to be that vote that right. passed the motion to ban meth. Now there are some clubs like the Banditos who have banned meth now. And, you know, there are clubs like the Banditos and the Mongols who you, if you commit a criminal act, um, you're kicked out of the club. And that's the result of these clubs being targeted and hit with these RICO cases so heavily. Um, right. You know, because the feds are able to turn simple things like, well, actually, one of the things that, that caused me to write the book was a member of the Mongols that I watched risk his freedom to testify in court and testify contrary to the terms of his plea agreement that he testified he was coerced by the government into signing. So he didn't spend 25 years in prison for an eighth of weed that he had unknowingly given to an undercover agent at a Mongols party 
because he didn't want to ride home with it in his pocket. He didn't sell it to him. He wasn't trying to commit any crimes. In fact, he was trying to avoid driving, riding home with a little bit of marijuana in his pocket. Mm -hmm. Ironically, marijuana is legal now in the state of California. But back when this guy was, this incident occurred in 2007, you know, it wasn't. And, you know, he they roped him up, put him in federal lockup for a year. He was looking at 25 years in prison. And then they came to him right before trial and said, hey, you want out? You want to get out of jail free card? Just admit that your club is a criminal enterprise in this plea agreement. And we'll give you a small fine and a couple years probation. You can go on your way. What are you going to do? Are you going to go to a federal mm -hmm. trial where you know there's a 90 percent conviction rate? Or are you going to take that deal that lets you go back to your home? And, and in his case, he was a single father. So, of course, he took the deal. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, fast forward 10 years to 2018, October of 2018, I'm sitting in a federal courtroom and I'm watching this man, this Mongols member, get advised by a judge that if he testifies contrary to his plea agreement, he could be charged with federal perjury and sent back in prison. And I'm watching the federal prosecutor and the ATF case agent chomping at the bit for him to testify so they could send him to prison for testifying against his plea agreement. Mm -hmm. He got on the stand like a man and took that risk and told the truth to the jury about what happened to him and how he ended up with that RICO conviction and told him about how he ended up with a previous RICO conviction for just being at Laughlin in 2002 when the riot occurred and he protected one of his buddies one of his brothers and in the process he was shot five times and stabbed a bunch of times mm -hmm. and taken out of there on a stretcher but somehow he still gets charged with rico and, and had to take a plea deal on that case too mm -hmm. to avoid spending the rest of his life in prison now it was total self-defense but the rules are different when you're in an outlaw motorcycle club than when you're an average american citizen automatically it's an organized crime you know, offense, and they try and charge you under what's called VICAR, violent crime in aid of racketeering, which allows them to put you in prison for life without parole. Mm. So they've got all the cards and, you know, they force their hand and they force you to take a deal. And so after watching that and understanding that, you know what, nobody's got the perspective on the Outlaw Motorcycle Club culture that I do and is willing to tell the truth about it because all the cops are liars. They're all the undercover agents that infiltrate the clubs, they do it because it's a great career. You get paid a lot of money, 200 grand a year plus bonuses to party with outlaw bikers and drink beer, you know, mm -hmm. for two, three years on end. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of it, you get a book deal because every one of these guys gets a book deal. And if you're Jay Dobbins, you sell the movie rights, you know? <laughs> yeah, so I was, I was going to bring that up because- They get rich the false narrative that, that we're a bunch of organized gangsters, yeah. when in reality, we're a bunch of middle-aged, most of us are over 40. Um, most are combat veterans. And if they're not combat veterans, they're staunchly patriotic. And all because you can't own a Harley Davidson and afford the dues on a motorcycle club and, and the cost of the lifestyle that comes along with it, unless you have a career. So 98% of them are gainfully employed. And I know doctors who are one percenters. I know lawyers who are one percenters. Um, I know special operators who are one percenters. I know a city councilman um, who's a one percenter. So you never know who's going to be in an outlaw motorcycle club. Mm. But what you do know about them, especially if they've got one of those, those what we consider prestigious careers, um, is that they're a man that, that is a man of respect and is willing to take risks for what he believes. And that's cool. Yeah. Well, and, and you, you talk about that, that Laughlin incident. And, <laughs> uh, and you talk a lot in the book about harassment of uh, OMC members. Uh, you know, Jay Dobbins, I, you know, I'm in Tucson and uh, Jay went to Arizona. I, yeah. uh, I, know, I know him. I read his book, No Angel, and he's, you know, he's a legend here. Yeah. But um, you you uh, contrast his version of, of that incident in, in 2002. And um, do you feel back then, and this was when there was a lot of, uh, you said you were mentioning the, the clubs were at war, that... Uh, that law enforcement, federal agencies, stoked that uh, along and did not have, uh, I guess the best way to say it, the best intentions because they believed that they were bringing down um, gangsters and, and uh, organized crime uh, individuals. 
No, that was that was done so that John Ciccone from ATF, the case agent in charge mm -hmm. of Operation Black Biscuit, and Jay Dobbins, who was an egomaniac and looking for the case that he could write a book about and retire on because he hadn't really had anything that spectacular. And uh, another officer from uh, uh, there in the Arizona area, Chuck Scoville, um, he happens to be the president of the International Outlaw Motorcycle Gang Investigators Association. That was the three of them conspiring together to make a case that they could become famous off of. It would make their careers. They could all write books. They could get TV money. And, uh, you know, then they could go ahead and retire. And so when we talk about Operation Black Biscuit in particular, which is the, the, the operation that Jay Dobbins is known for, the thing that you have to pay attention to, especially if you've read his book and you've seen any of his interviews, is Jay's version on how they started the Solos Angels CM, that, that real motorcycle club that he used to stir up trouble in Arizona with the rest of those undercover agents, that story always changes on how they actually got that chapter going and that charter going. And the truth is revealed in Vince Cifalou's 2018 book, Rat Snakes, where he dimes out Dobbins for going south of the border without ATF authority to buy that charter. He paid $500 to get that charter from the Solo Angeles, which are based out of Mexico. So obviously he had to go to Mexico. And Sifalu, an undercover agent himself and known ATF whistleblower, details the incident in his book mm -hmm. and says Dobbins went out down there and violated ATF policy at the highest level. Now, he told the story in 2018, which is after the statute of limitations for federal crimes had expired, so Dobbins wouldn't get in any trouble. But he also reveals in that same book that the agents involved in Black Biscuit were illegally wiretapping the bikers. So now you've got a case where the lead undercover agent, before the operation even was launched, conspired and with the knowledge of undercover agents within the enhanced undercover program for the ATF, went rogue, went to Mexico. Presumably he took his undercover ID and his undercover vehicle and probably a gun to go to Mexico because he's not going to use his own identification in his own vehicles because that's going to leave a paper trail that goes right back to him and his family. And it's going to, ATF's going to know that he would have went rogue. And so more than likely he went back, he went down there on his undercover identification. Either way, we know he went down there without ATF authority and without ATF authority, he has no authority to operate in Mexico. So what we know is Jay Dobbins conspired to commit major federal offenses and international offenses to go buy that charter to start that investigation. And if we were looking at that from the perspective of an outlaw motorcycle club, if the situation was turned around, the way they described that is he conspired with other agents to further the criminal enterprise by going and getting that patch. And that patch and that charter allowed him then to further the criminal enterprise, start the solo on Jalez in Arizona, and then use the dynamiting the pawn technique with the angels, um, or that's what I call it. And, and what I mean by that is, is um, the ATF has a history that they started in the 90s, late 90s, using Jay Dobbins, ironically, um, and some other undercovers in Colorado to insert themselves as a real club or, or, or pretending to be a real club in order to, to cause a, a club in the area that's known to be territorial to try and pull their patches, an indictable RICO offense, a violent RICO offense. And so um, that's what they were hoping would happen with the Angels. The Angels in Arizona at the time, they'd just come over from the Dirty Dozen. The Dirty Dozen were known just like the, the outsiders were in Oregon and in Washington for being fiercely territorial, having a rule that no other outlaw clubs could exist and keeping everybody out. Well, the ATF was hoping when Dobbins showed up with his solo on Jalez, which are not known as an outlaw club, that the Angels would you know, see them as victims and pull their patches. That's not the way it works anymore. The mm -hmm. clubs, by that point, had started to stop pulling patches because the feds had started charging guys with armed robbery and aid to racketeering mm -hmm. uh, for doing it. You know, so a simple bar fight and taking a trophy now was armed robbery and aid to racketeering. You're going for 25 to life. Um, and so the clubs had backed that down or started backing that down at, at that point. 
Um, and uh, yeah, so that begs the question of, was Operation Black Biscuit really the greatest undercover investigation against an outlaw motorcycle club of all time, like Dobbins says, or was it a racketeering conspiracy that Dobbins and other undercover agents and case managers with ATF ran against the Angels? And when you look at the, the, the charges and the convictions that resulted, yeah, they charged the hell out of those Angels. And there were some flamboyant, you know, sensationalized charges there, but none of them stuck. Very, very few of them yeah. stuck. Like what, and a lot of prison? them, huh? I think only six went to prison. Or I don't know how many only actually. Only six were convicted. Only two convicted. went to prison, yeah. and the sentences were really, really short. And they were for things. They were for crimes that Dobbins manufactured. Like one of the crimes um, that the individual went to prison for was arms trafficking. And Dobbins had gone to this individual and been pestering him to sell him a gun. He didn't tell him what he was going to use the gun for or anything like that. The individual sold Dobbins a gun. And then Dobbins went and faked that murder of a Mongol. And then they charged the Hell's Angel with selling a gun that was used in a, a staged murder. And so even that charge uh, was was reduced significantly. So, and and that's the thing when when you know I don't like to say that the cops are liars because not all cops are liars. But what you see when you go back and you, you study outlaw, what they call outlaw motorcycle gang investigations, and that's a label that law enforcement gave them, um, is that from the get-go, they've been using street theater and having to manufacture charges against clubs and going out of their way to create the narrative that, that they're these organized criminal enterprises. There's not actually any convictions that have gone to trial where it's been proven in court that, yeah, these guys are running a sophisticated criminal enterprise and these guys are the sellers and these guys are the traffickers and, and these guys are the dealers, you know, and here's where the money is and we've got it in their minutes. You've never seen any of that because it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. But what you have seen is, is the Fed's strong arm guys, like in the Colorado Springs case from the 90s, or in the Angels case uh, um, from Black Biscuit, or even more so it, with the Mongols case from 2008 with Doc Cavazos was running that show. Um, you see these cases where they charge these guys and they use the federal conviction rate to force them and coerce them into taking plea deals where the feds write the statement of facts in the plea deal. And the statement of facts always say that they, the, the defendant agrees they committed the crime on behalf of the enterprise you know, and to further the enterprise. And so they write that racketeering narrative in there. The person signs off to get out of jail and then they can go and say, look, you know, we've got these convictions, but where's the jail time, you know? And so I've had friends that were convicted of serious racketeering crimes for doing nothing more than taking $250 of raffle money across a state line to a meeting to turn it into the mother chapter because they pool all the chapter's ticket sales together. I mean, mm -hmm. What we get charged for is organized crime. It is normal everyday stuff for any other organization, whether it's the Boy Scouts or the police killed, you know? Yeah. Well, I, and I think when it comes down to it, folks, uh, you know, a, it's well documented in your book, uh, Patriot Gangster, what happened in Laughlin in uh, 2002, and also uh, Jay Dobbins' book, uh, No Angel. Um, whether you know people want to make up their own mind uh, of what the story is, but uh, you know Jay's version is that you know he really felt that he was doing something to uh, stop organized crime in in our country, and uh, in the end he uh, was felt betrayed by the ATF, and I think his his he was uh, betrayed by the ATF. His his, his case is still ongoing, um, but going back to that in, in 2002, the, it was the Laughlin River Run. And it was a gathering that happened annually. Um, you say basically in your book, they, the Hell's Angels or any of those clubs were not looking for a fight. No. And yet it, it, it came down to it. Um, so how do you think it got to that point? And what do you think the motives for the ATF even being there? Because they were sitting at a bar in there uh, and, and, and how it all went down. So really, so, what, do you, what do you think? How did it happen? Here's why... ATF doesn't want, and I own GIA and law enforcement in general doesn't want me to, to give my input on this is because I understand everything from both sides. You know, I've had the same outlaw motorcycle gang training that, that Jay Dobbins has had, and I've actually had more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, 
here's the thing. In order to understand ATF and, and the task force outlaw motorcycle gang investigations, which always have ATF involvement somewhere because they're the clearinghouse for information on outlaw motorcycle clubs mm -hmm. um, and, and the investigative process. They're the, the guys who do the dirty deeds when they need a, an undercover agent because there's not very much accountability in ATF. There's more now than there was, but back in the day Dobbins was working, there was almost none, which is you know, what Sifulu cites is the way he was able to go to Mexico and do that. Um, but, you know, um, what we've, the thing that you have to understand is, is with Laughlin, um, there's agents within the ATF that have made their careers off of investigating outlaw motorcycle clubs. And, and it's because they're low risk to investigate your, the, your chances of getting shot or stabbed or even beaten are really, really low unless you put yourself in that, into a situation where that's the consequence. Um, and, and the cops know this, they've known this since the early nineties. Uh, um, so, but the ATF has made outlaw motorcycle clubs, they're bad guys since 1974 because the FBI was taking all the, the glory with the mob and they needed a bad guy or ATF was gonna get shut down. And so they made, outlaw motorcycle clubs, they're mafia. And over the years, because they've been able to sell this narrative that outlaw motorcycle clubs or, or organized crime, they've gotten bigger budgets, they've gotten looser policies on how they investigate the, the club or the clubs, they've got better backstopping. I mean, and now since, the, the, since 2001 and the Patriot Act has come into play, and then classifying outlaw motorcycle club members with military training as military trained gang members, they can usurp the Patriot Act and do whatever they want to us. And so we've seen outlaw motorcycle club investigations um, morph into really the same covert human intelligence operations we use overseas against Al Qaeda and other terrorist organizations, mm -hmm. exactly the same. And they're designed to infiltrate, influence, instigate and dismantle and uh, from within. And so law enforcement constantly has paid confidential sources of information in these clubs and they're constantly gathering intelligence. And when nothing was happening between the clubs and the Mongols were growing like they were back in 2002, well, well 2001, 2002, um, and even after that, mm -hmm. um, it allowed the ATF, because Doc Cavazos, who was the, the National Sergeant at Arms of the Mongols at the time of the Laughlin incident and ended up becoming national president, um, because he was heavily recruiting Sereno gang members into the Mongols, the feds knew it was going to be real easy to instigate a fight between the Mongols and the Hells Angels at Laughlin because they'd both be staying in the same place. And for years, and the feds knew this, although you'll never hear Dobbins admit it, in fact, he lies and says that you know, they weren't stay, they'd never stayed there before. The Hells Angels and the Mongols have been staying in Harris together for years before that without any problems, uh, just like they were staying there, you know, in 2002. And Laughlin really makes, any casino makes the greatest investigative tool for an outlaw motorcycle gang investigator because everything's on film. And so what they did, even though Las Vegas Metro PD had cut back their their budget for police and for law enforcement officers to cover the Laughlin event in 2002 and their own threat assessment said there's no real threat of violence between the clubs. ATF came in and said, no, 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 we're going to flood it with our undercovers, our contract sources of, of information, and you guys really need to, to, you know, be ready. And then they started using individuals within Las Vegas PD who disagreed with the official stance of the agency that, oh, outlaw motorcycle gangs are not a threat. We don't need to investigate them. And those individuals working with ATV, ATF then went and met with the Hells Angels and, and told some of their leadership, hey, the Mongols are gonna come and attack you, you know, and, and we're just gonna be here to, to, you know, make sure that doesn't happen. Well, you, mm. you tell any outlaw motorcycle club, we're gonna hang around you to protect you from another motorcycle club and they're gonna tell the cops to, to get lost. And that's what the angels did. And then they went to, to the Mongols and told them the same thing. Hey, we hear that the angels are gonna attack you. In the meantime, you've got Dobbins, you've got Jenna McGuire, you've got Darren Kozlowski, you've got you know, two other undercover, well, they're, those agents, the three that I just mentioned, were in Rose's Cantina in Harrah's drinking 
while they're on the job, right. undercover, and they're talking crap to the Mongols about the angels, getting them fired up. And Dobbins had previously been down um, at the Flamingo with the angels and was talking shit in their bar, and, and, or talking smack, and he had two contract sources of information that were with him um, that they were doing the same thing. They were hanging arounds with the Hells Angels, um, and they had a third informant who had just come on board um, named Mason Mike Kramer, who was an L Arizona Hells Angel. And, uh, you know, they were all there stirring up problems. Next thing you know, a call goes out uh, because, you know, when you've got cops going to, to angels and telling them the Mongols are going to attack the angels and, and, and going to the Mongols and telling them the Mongols are going to, you know, vice versa, you're firing up both sides. And so any disrespect is going to be the match that it takes to light off the whole thing. And that's what happened when, because it, there were only a, a small handful of Hell's Angels staying in Harris, um, they were outnumbered by the Mongols in the bar and they put out a call. Um, you know, I, I know this very well because Josh was working for security, security for the Hell's Angels um, at the time. He was at their command post, their security command post that the call went out and they said, Hey, things are getting weird. Can you guys come down, you know, and, and, uh, make sure we get out of here. Okay. And that's what happened. They went down, but when you get two sides that have been stirred up, all it took was one hot headed angel who was a Sergeant in arms and young to get a name called and disrespected by a Mongol. Next thing you know, he kicks the Mongol in the chest everything lit off at that point and uh you know it went down the way it did mm -hmm. but again you look at laughlin they charged the hell out of that as a rico and, and guys on both sides were indicted but those cases fell apart because of the agent misconduct by the atf that they needed to cover up so the trials couldn't the cases couldn't ever go to trial mm -hmm. and the other thing that the you know right off the bat the angels and the mongols were both internally as clubs saying the atf had to have set this up and when defense attorneys started asking for the surveillance video from the casino, because the ATF claimed, no, we didn't set it up. We weren't there monitoring the surveillance system. Yeah. Like word had leaked out that they were. Well, that cameras, defense, I think. defense attorneys a route to prove that the ATF yeah. was lying. And so they just, the prosecutors abandoned the case because the ATF was lying. You know, did they and, know who the who they think that Dobbins and those guys were? Did they, they, they think they were agents Dobbins or they were just, uh, what kind of cred did they have to be able to even stir the shit up with the, with, the, with you're, you're in a bar, you're yeah. in a bar, you can come sit down and have a drink. And what these ATF undercover agents like to do, because I've, I've been targeted by them before yeah. is they buy you beer, they buy you drinks and they'll buddy up to you. Um, you know, John Carr was one in particular in Reno in 2013. Yeah. I, I was introduced to him by a national or excuse me, a, a regional officer for, the Vagos Motorcycle Club, and uh, he was a president of, of his chapter and very respected in the Confederation of Clubs. And I had no reason to believe he'd be, you know, introducing me to an undercover agent. And that Vago had previously been introduced to me by a national officer. So, you know, I figured they were good guys. And, uh -huh. and you know, we we sat and drank for two days together and I never paid for a single drink. Uh -huh. um, but the conversation was weird because inevitably he would he would try and talk to me about something criminal or get me to go do something with him that was criminal. And, you know, um, I didn't suspect anything then. But, you know, a little while later, when it got re revealed that he was one of the undercovers, I'm like, mm. oh, I remember that guy. Yeah, you know, that made sense. Well, you know, it's it's a fascinating read, uh, Jeff. And uh, you uh, I mean, just an incredible period of your life, which you devoted a lot to. Um, but at what point, when did it start to sour for you? Because uh, I know that that, um, that belief has changed dramatically now. And when, when, uh, what caused that to happen? And, so, uh, you know, what was a series of events following it? Um, it's tough for me to, to say when exactly things soured. But what really soured me initially was just I had been it, – it was probably – 2014 and I had been in the club world enough to know that what I had initially seen in the Hells Angels that made me say there's not brotherhood there that the brotherhood I'm looking for there I don't want to be part of that organization um, I'd come to realize that that same thing exists in every major outlaw motorcycle club including my own that I was part of 
And um, the more, like I mentioned earlier, ego is a big thing in outlaw motorcycle clubs. And the more respect and notoriety that Double D and I earned over the years, um, the more my own club or, or our own club turned against us. And because he was a second generation outsider, his dad had been a charter member that took home a chapter. They didn't mess with him quite as much as they messed with me, but they were constantly on me. And finally in 2014, they told me, um, I'd just been nominated for induction into the American Motorcycle Hall of Fame and come back from a great uh, speech that Double D and I gave from the steps of the Capitol in California. And we were changing the world. And, and my own club told me we had to stop because it was not outlaw biker stuff and it was not outsider stuff. And, mm. you know, we couldn't travel anymore. We couldn't be involved in it. And at that point, um, that was the first time I quit the club. I actually quit the club twice. <laughs> I just, in the middle of that special meeting that they had called to complain about, um, you know, what we were doing in the rights movement. Um, and all our travel and all our notoriety. Um, I just said, you know what, I've had enough of this. And I took off my belt buckle off my member because I had a member belt buckle that you can't keep anything that has the club logo on it when you quit. So I took off my patch, took off my belt buckle, took off my club rings and walked right over to my sergeant at arms and turned them into him and in front of everybody in the club. And I said, I quit. If my involvement in the motorcycle club community and my membership is going to be such controversy, within our own club, I don't need this. Mm. I'm Twitch, I'll keep doing me. And I quit and I walked out. And uh, that lasted for, <laughs> I think, well, officially I was out of the club for quite a while, um, but unofficially I never left. I mean, you know, I was at the clubhouse drinking the next day just without my patch and without all the drama. And mm. I was still clued in on all the club business and all the secrets, and I was still handling stuff out on a national level. Um, I was just doing it without my my colors on, and even the club world, the, the folks in the club world, um, they didn't suspect I was out of the club for over a year, um, mm. or, or, or almost a year, I think, was when the first person finally asked me, because you can't ask any club business questions of members from other clubs, um, you know, if you're not in their club. So you can't even ask something simple, like, are you still in the club? Um, and with me, because I had all my tattoos and I was out in good standing and, and I was still allowed to wear member shirts, people just assumed I was in the club because I was so hardcore about being a one percenter and being an outsider and being a defender of the culture that it didn't make sense I'd be out of the club. And eventually I put my, my colors back on. I, I came back in the club and when I did that, people were like, whoa, you left the club for a while, didn't you? And I was like, yeah, you know? Um, so that's where really where this I soured was because there was just, I, I needed to be able to do what was best for the motorcycle club culture, not what was best for me. I mean, you know, it might've, it would have definitely saved me a lot of headache and drama to keep those colors on and, and not have quit the first time, but I would have been letting the club push me around and, and I wouldn't do that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I did what I did. I'm glad I did it. And when they brought me back in, they, you know, um, cause as soon as I quit, they wanted me back. Um, but it took some time. And, and when they brought me back in, um, it was right back into the same drama and bullshit, you know? Mm -hmm. I was just as famous as I ever was, actually more at that point, and and, uh, and, and you know, I, I immediately started getting it from the other chapter, and, uh, you know, then there were some things that, that my club was honor bound to do as one percenters, and they didn't do, and, you know, um, since I was one of the guys that helped that club put the diamond on, I was willing to do it, and when they wouldn't let me do it, I realized I was in the wrong club, you know, that yeah. the, the club world... And my own club had changed so much over 22 years that, that I didn't belong anymore. You know, yeah. I wasn't like the rest of the members anymore. I was still stuck in, in, you know, the late nineties, early two thousands. And, and even though there were aspects of my thinking that had changed to conform with the modern one percenter world, there were still things that I think the, the, or I thought, you know, we needed to put our foot down in order to be able to maintain that identity and our integrity as one percenters. And, the club just wasn't willing to do that. And so I put my, my patch down and quit. Um, and it was the best decision I've ever made. Um, well, and, and, and you were out good, I guess, as you say, yes. or out in good standing. I'm sure that'll change. I don't know if that's changed. I mean, if you're still there or is it uh, uh, to the point where <laughs> this, this book might change that. But um, 
why, what made you decide that you you wanted to, to document this, to, to write the book? I had to, if, if I didn't, like I said, if I didn't tell my story, because I've got, you know, when you talk about expert witnesses, when you talk yeah. about these outlaw motorcycle gang experts like Jay Dobbins is, um, or he likes to represent himself as, um, when they call it, us into court to testify, it all comes down to your curriculum vitae. A and the best outlaw motorcycle club expert for the defense, um, prior to me throwing my hat in the ring, um, is my good friend, Dr. Will Delaney. Um, mm -hmm. And he, he, um, he lacks the law enforcement experience. While he knows a tremendous amount about motorcycle clubs and has an excellent resume, Mm -hmm. um, and he's a, a retired professor of national security. He's never been a law enforcement officer. He's never had outlaw motorcycle gang training. And where I had had that, um, and you know, my training eclipses theirs, uh, their best expert. I knew I had a voice that was credible for the culture for the first time. I was the first voice that anybody had to listen to. Mm -hmm. It's not just that they would listen yeah. to when I get on the stand and I, I, I you know, have my curriculum vitae scrutinized, it's beyond reproach. Yeah, so yeah. I knew that they'd have to listen to me. And when I saw what I saw with Benji Leva during the Mongols Nation trial in 2018, and he he was willing to take the risk to protect his club and protect the culture, I knew if I stayed silent and didn't tell my story with my credibility, I'd be doing the culture that I dedicated my entire adult life to protect a total disservice. Yeah. So you, you mentioned earlier that my, my status may change with my old club and I may be put out bad to an outlaw biker. That's everything. Your honor is everything. A and yeah. that standing is everything. Um, but I'll give, excuse me. Yeah. I'm going to give everything up. I know it's in book two and three. And um, I will be put out bad. They'll change my status. My honor is not attached to that status. My honor is attached to what I did for the Outlaw Motorcycle Club community with all those great other Outlaw Motorcycle Club members because it wasn't something I did. And I hope that the book portrays it correctly. It was what we did. You know, all of us came together. Mm -hmm. We're not warring clans like they say. We're good Americans who are patriotic. And we put down our feuds that had existed in some cases for over 40 years to come together for the motorcycle profiling movement and to protect the culture. Mm -hmm. So if I stood down and I stayed silent because I was worried about my status or having to cover my club tattoos or any of that other stuff, I couldn't live with myself. You what know, is like, the condition of uh, OMCs today? Uh, is it uh, kind of a very Sons of punch, Anarchy. Not nothing? Yeah, really? yeah, Sons of Anarchy has made outlaw motorcycle clubs so watered down and wussy that um, they're a version. I mean, they, they aren't anything similar to what I joined. Mm -hmm. And um, the men you have in 1% clubs now, a lot of them would never have made it past the prospect period in the days that I was in. Mm -hmm. And most of them are not willing to do the violence that all of us were willing to do back in the day. And and remained willing to do until we left. But you see it with all with all the clubs, whether it's the Hells Angels and guys like George Christie leaving, or the Vagos and guys like Sarge quitting, or me leaving the Outsiders. All the really famous guys, all the really respected guys in the club world um, are getting out because yeah. our clubs aren't what we joined. Uh, so what is your life like now? You've, you've left it and... and uh, uh, <laughs> You fear any retaliation at this point? I mean, what what is what is your life like? At this I, point? I fear absolutely no retaliation from the Outlaw Motorcycle Club community at this point. Now, I absolutely fear retaliation from law enforcement, um, and I've had to take great steps to keep myself protected and hidden from law enforcement. Mm. And uh, you know, and um, that's the biggest threat to me. To, I don't know where to begin to describe my life after the club. Um, I think it, it goes right along with uh, your show. I was 42 years old when I quit the club and I had dedicated my entire adult life to being the best outlaw motorcycle club member I could be. Mm -hmm. And to that community. 
And to do that, I had to sacrifice a lot of things about my professional career that I couldn't move forward with. They let me be in law enforcement, but you can't be superstar guy if you're going to be superstar one percenter. So I had to mute that career down. And as soon as I left the club, I jumped back into contracting and doing high threat protective services right away. Mm-hmm. Um, did some anti-kidnapping work um, right after Trump made it illegal to go to Cuba. I went to Cuba <laughs> for journalistic reasons and, and yeah. had the time of my life and found out that we've been lied to about Cuba as well. <laughs> and uh, um, I actually got to meet the president of the first motorcycle club in Cuba. Um, they had just started a motorcycle club after one of the guys um, had pirated an episode of Sons of Anarchy off of Mexican television. Really? So that's how their motorcycle wow. club culture really? got started in Cuba. And, and I had some influence in that now. Um, yeah. But Really, I you know I grabbed life uh, by the throat and gave it a good shaking and and went on some adventures and and started recapturing that and mm-hmm. next thing you know I get in this horrible car accident and physically destroyed and um, because it was up to the government to put me back together and I wasn't allowed to use my personal medical insurance I was on their timetable and I watched my life destroyed by them realized I probably wasn't going to be operational as a contractor again and so I enrolled myself. Um, in a master canine trainers academy to get certified as a master canine trainer and train military law enforcement and personal protection dogs because it's been a passion of mine for uh, you know over 15 years now mm-hmm. and um, I was living there and going home one day a week uh, to spend time with my wife or she was my fiance at the time um, and uh, um, it was on one of my days off I had gone home the Department of Homeland Security contacted the director of the training academy and told him he's a Belgian national um, and a former Navy SEAL and he has a PhD. He's a respectable guy. Um, Mm -hmm. They told him if he continued to train me to train dogs, they would indict him for aiding and abetting an outlaw motorcycle gang member. He'd be put in prison. And once he got out of prison, they'd deport him. And so he had to kick me out of the dog training school. And because he was supposed to be the best man in my wedding and, and uh, we were supposed to have my wedding at his place, we couldn't get married at his place. Um, that was all retaliation for me a few months earlier going to that Mongols Nation tri- trial. When I walked in there, John Ciccone from the ATF saw me, immediately got red faced and pissed off and leaned over to the AUSA's ear and whispered in it and next thing I know, I've got him questioning me as to whether I'm there to testify and telling me I can't sit in the courtroom and watch the trial. And I'm like, hey, I'm not here to testify. It's my constitutional right to sit in this courtroom and watch this goes watch this go down. And the judge told him it is, you know, and we went back on with the trial, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but mm-hmm. after a few months after that, then I have the DHS incident. Uh, about eight months after that, I went to Southeast Asia for some adventure. And when I come home from that, I, I'm coming through customs and immigration and they take my passport, ask me some questions and tell me, welcome home, Mr. Burns, have a nice day and wave me through. And I'm about 150 feet into the US and they tell me, whoa, 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 you gotta come back here, you can't go in yet. And I'm like, what do you mean I can't go in yet? You know, no, you aren't, you aren't allowed into the US right now. We gotta ask you some more questions. And so they start asking me these questions and from the questions it became apparent that someone in federal law enforcement has gotten access to my my uh, um, travel file and put things in there that say that I've gone to countries that I've never been to and I've been had interactions with hostile interactions with foreign law enforcement that I've never had. And it took well, after they took me into custody and took me through three different interrogations. Um, I was finally released and, you know, you could tell by the time I got to the third guy, he realized that everything in the computer about me was, was garbage. And Mm. he actually apologized for harassing me. But so, so that's what I deal with now to this day. I mean, this was just September that, that I got deported from my own country. Um, and there's nothing you can do about that because according to the, you know, the Department of Justice and every federal law enforcement agency, I'm an organized crime member, even though I've got no criminal history and I'm not in an outlaw motorcycle club anymore, you know, and on top of that, I'm a domestic terrorist threat because according to them, I'm now a military trained gang member. Um, So 
while I don't look at myself that way, officially, that's the way the government treats me day in and day out. And, and that's my biggest fear is because being labeled that way and, and having individuals with that kind of authority and access saying whatever they want to about you in restricted law enforcement systems where you can't get access to see what they say about you because it's all restricted information. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. that's the most scary thing that, that you can have because you got big, big Brother writing your narrative, just like the ATF wrote Outlaw Motorcycle Club Culture's narrative for the last 60 years. They've done it to me for the last 20 years, and they've really stepped up their game since I, they found out I was going to release this book. Everything they've done, every major time they've targeted me, with the exception of when they've had the undercovers approach me in the last couple months and try and set me up, has been directly related to a post about my book on social media. So the DHS incident with the Dog Training Academy happened the day after I announced that I was going to be releasing a book. Mm. Uh, nobody knew. I had been keeping no. it secret because I knew it was going to happen. And I knew the ATF was watching me, but people needed to know I was going to write a book. So I threw it out there. And sure enough, the next day, all hell broke loose in my mm. personal life. And mm. it wasn't because of anything I was doing, you know, but I make an honest living. And, uh, you know, I'm not involved in any criminal activity. I live out in the middle of nowhere and, and play with dogs, you know, so I don't know why I'm such a threat to them other than what I know. And, and uh, they will go to the greatest lengths they can to to uh, make sure that I don't tell my secrets or their Well, secret, I guess. Uh, it sounds like they're out. And uh, by the time this uh, episode drops, it will be uh, yeah. available. And how can people get a, a, a hold of this first volume, right? There's going to be more than one. Patriot Gangster Volume 1, Evolution of an Outlaw, is, is the first book. And it'll be out everywhere tomorrow. It's going to be in all the major online retailers, including Amazon and BarnesandNoble.com, uh, as well as retail stores. And um, So you can find it there. We've got signed copies available of both the paperback and hardcover on, on my website, PatriotGangster.com. Um, so yeah, well, it's, it, the, the storm is, is just started, Jeff, uh, we'll oh, see I know that. <laughs> what happens. And, uh, I, I'll tell you, I'd love to have you back, uh, when you get the other ones out. And also, I think, uh, especially with what we're seeing happening in our country now with the, the unrest that, uh, an episode talking with you about, uh, you know, how people protect themselves and, and the evolution of what you think is going to happen with our our law enforcement in this country, I think would make another great episode, but I really want to thank you uh, for coming on. And again, uh, it's uh, patriotgangster.com to get more information. Um, and if you're, uh, you know, uh, stay tuned for that, but uh, you can get a copy of it. And really folks, it is, uh, it is an incredible read uh, in a world that uh, you had uh, no idea about and how it all happens. And uh, uh, Jeff Burns is, is the man behind it. And uh, also, folks, if you are uh, listening to us on a Apple Podcasts, I, I hope that you will please uh, uh, go there and uh, subscribe to Upside of 40 with Sean Mooney and give us a five-star rating and a review. Uh, it really helps get the word out about the podcast. Also, you can catch every episode on YouTube. we got a YouTube channel. That link is included in the notes. Uh, just go Or just go to YouTube and search Upside of 40 with Sean Mooney. Not only will you find every podcast there, there are also many videos featuring all things for men of a certain age which is uh, a big group uh, who follow me. Uh, when you go there to uh, go to the YouTube channel, be sure to subscribe as well. And uh, if you'd like to contact me, you can do that uh, uh, via email. Just go to upside of 40 at gmail.com and you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at upside of 40. And also folks, I will include in our notes for this episode, uh, a direct link to uh, Jeff's website, but uh, Jeff Burns, really, thank you so much. I really, this is a fascinating conversation and we, I, I can't wait to do it again with you. Thanks so much, Sean. I really appreciate it. All right, everybody, there you have it. Uh, until next time, I'm Sean Mooney. Thanks for tuning in to Upside of 40. I'm out. Mm -hmm.